please give it up for Sean John's president, Mr. Jeff Tweedy. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, it's been a long time getting you to the Power Maker stage. First, I want to just say it's my honor to have you here. Thanks for coming and blessing everybody in the room with your presence. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. Jeff, you are an icon in the fashion and entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. And you have so many accolades under your belt. But it's important for me and it's important for the viewers to understand where did it all begin for you? It actually began in Washington, D.C., where I was born and raised. And I had this, this, this um, knack to want to do better in my life because my mom was the sort of matriarch of the family. And in my family was we lived in a two bedroom apartment in Washington, D.C. It was nine of us in a two bedroom apartment. So, you know, my aunts and uncles weren't doing well. I had cousins that was in, incarcerated. And I didn't know what a better life was, but I knew it wasn't this. So I always had this idea of like, I can do better. Um, and it just, just, things just happened from there. Where was the father in the picture? My father was, uh, my father came around every birthday. Really? Yeah, once in a while. You say nine of you guys, is that nine no. brothers and sisters? No, that was, that was one sister, my mom, aunts, uncles, and cousins. Wow, so you really did come from humble beginnings. Yeah, very mm -hmm. humble. But, but you did, at that age, you don't, know, you, you don't know what life is like. This is it, because you're on your block, you go to school, and you come home, and that's really it. And your, your relatives, your, your cousins, aunts, uncles, they live the same way. So you didn't have an idea what, there was no videos back then. Correct. There was Correct. no better way to see what I'm missing. There was nothing to inspire by, because there was no vision. Anybody in your family, um, I'm just curious, Anybody in the family into fashion? No. Just, just uncles that were somewhat uncles, somewhat pimps, <laughs> that, that had a certain style about themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, number runners, they had a style, but no one in the fashion industry, no. Okay. Let's walk through education. Mm -hmm. um, FIT? FIT. H.D. Woodson in Washington, D.C., then FIT. Okay. Yeah. So is yeah. that how you made your way to New York? Yeah, actually the way I sort of made my way to New York is, is, I'll tell you the short of the story. I used to work at a store called Bridges of Georgetown in Washington, D.C. The way I got to Georgetown was actually the bus route that I would take from my high school to my home used to go straight up past the White House to, to Georgetown. If you know nothing about Georgetown, it's like waking up in the middle of 57th and Madison Avenue or 5th Avenue or in the middle of Soho. So I was on a bus one time and I fell asleep on a bus, true story, coming home from school. And I wake up in this area, this community that's like, where am I? <laughs> there's people sitting outside eating, people with smiles, there's grass, there's stores I can't pronounce. Like, what is this? So I get back on the bus because I didn't know, I didn't want to get in no trouble, right? And then the next few days I take a ride up back to Georgetown and I started walking around. So you can imagine a guy that's never left their neighborhood that all of a sudden ends up on 57th and Madison Avenue. Wow. What that looks like, what that wow. smells like, what it, I mean, it's a whole nother world. Cause there was, again, there was no videos, there was no dynasty, there was no TV shows, there was no, you know. How old were you at that time? I was, what was that? <laughs> I was, uh, at that time I, no, at that time I was 15. I lied and said I was 16 to get my first job. Okay, tell me yeah. about that first job. It was scooping ice cream at a restaurant called Crumpets. It's like a bagel <laughs> place. And the way I got the, in the industry was that I used to work Friday evening, Saturday, fr I'm sorry, Thursday evening, Friday evenings, and it's all day Saturday and Sunday. And my job was scooping ice cream or making coffee for the local guys in Georgetown. And one day um, I got to know the guys that worked at Bridges of Georgetown, one of the, the sales guys. And Bridges of Georgetown was like a small Barney's. It was an expensive men's store. And one day I just asked the guy, do you guys need a stock boy? And they said, yeah, we do. 
quickly put down the scoop of ice cream, <laughs> went over, interviewed, and got the job as a stock boy. Are you looking for the stock boy in that particular store, or was it just... Stock boy in that particular store. So you actually wanted to work. I didn't know no other store. That was the men's store. And the, by the way these guys came in dressed every day, I wanted to be part of that. Understood. That, that was my inspiration. Like, I looked at them like, look at the way these guys are dressed. Jesus. You know, it's so important because it's this common theme. Every time we do an interview and you're touching on it, everybody in some way, shape, or form always says you just have to get in the door. It's not, yeah. you know, about the position. Yeah. Right. It's, it's right. get in however you right. can, whether it's right. internship. Yeah. In your case, it's stock board. Right. So you're saying, hey, I had a job. I'm scooping right. ice cream. Right. But... I'm within eye right. shot of a store right. where I see, you know, men mm -hmm. dressed right. like they're about something. Right. And I, I knew I just needed to get in. I think sometimes we have to humble ourselves to take that first step. And, and someone told me years ago, a lot of people like to take the elevator before they take the steps. And I didn't, I didn't know. I just wanted to do something. I just wanted to keep moving. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to keep moving. That's what I did. Nice. So stock boy. And at that moment, I wanted to be in the fashion industry. So being a stock boy in an expensive store like that, you can learn yourself. So you take the extra time to know what kind of fabric they're selling, to know how shoes are made, to know how ties are made, where the silks from, where the fabrics come from in Italy. You take your time to learn all these things. No one taught me this. Really? I learned it on my own in the store being a stock boy. Okay, so you're young at this time. Was it the store? When you got bit by the fashion bug, or was it always in you? Even though you came from humble beginnings, yeah. were you always a sharp dresser? I, listen, back then I listened to Michael Jackson. I liked the way Michael Jackson, <laughs> Jackson 5 dressed, so that was like in Soul Train. So mm -hmm. you looked at that, and that was, your, that was really your fashion inspiration. There was nothing else. So I think it was just um, I was in an environment that taught me all about $2,000 suits and taught me about $800 shoes and taught me about thousand dollar watches wow. and who wouldn't want to embrace and learn uh, why these things are of that nature of that cost how mm -hmm. do they get there how do they get made why is that shirt two hundred dollars what what is the fabric about how's the buttons made so that fascinated you yeah oh obviously. absolutely yeah. absolutely absolutely how do you go from there and walk me through it i know at some point in your career mm -hmm. you had a run-in with Ralph? Ralph Lauren, Lauren. yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that before coming to New no, York that was or my, is it in D.C.? That was in D.C. Okay. My next step after Bridges of Joy Shine as a stock boy, um, I got fired from the job. Really? Um, really got fired from the job. I was a little cocky talking about a tie and one of the people didn't like it and the management got involved and they were like, I came in that Friday, they were like, Jeff, we need to talk to you. So I don't you know, know what, what it was are you about. firing me? What is this? <laughs> I don't even know what that felt like. I didn't even know that was possible. You know, so and I was like, listen, it, it did it affect me? It really it affected me because I was like, I got fired, but I'm 16 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get fired. I might get fired a few more times. And what happened was that that day I got fired. The next week there was Neiman Marcus up the road, like two miles away. It was a Neiman Marcus in in Washington D.C. You guys are familiar with Neiman Marcus? And I applied for a job. In two days they brought me in as the assistant manager of the women's. Uh, dress department, which was a $8 million business. And, and within six months, I was then the youngest sales manager of the men's department, which was a $28 million business I was responsible for. And at the time, I was 17, 18, 19 years old. Can we stop there? What did you come into Neiman Marcus? What was your position coming in? As an as a, um, assistant manager in the women's dress department assistant from the stock manager. boy. Yep. Yeah. And within six months... Yep. Oh, you are the youngest manager of the men's department. Wow. Because what happens is that my resume spoke for itself being at Bridges of Georgetown for like a year. That was a, a place to be. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you're going to realize that you learned a lot um, at Bridges of Georgetown. So the questions I was familiar with when, they, when I interviewed, the questions they hit me with, I was because I got the sales planning from the salespeople overhearing it. I, know, I knew stock levels. I knew quality of products. I knew how to order things. I knew how to fit garments. I knew all about, because I learned, I knew all about the industry. You literally in learned all of that from working being a, as stock a stock boy. boy. Yes. Yes. Because you're right there. You're, you're touching the garment. You're hearing every conversation, right? And the other thing that was interesting for me was I was in, engaged, engaged with the consumer. So that consumer at that level 
made a lot of money. These guys were, made a lot of money to, to be able to afford $2,000 suits, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So every Saturday, these guys would come in and, and buy six, seven suits at a time. The conversation they would have with the salesperson who's selling them the suits, I listen. What, whether they talking about politics, or whether they talking about the stock market, or whether they talking about sports, or whatever. That was my moment to embrace that. The store was only probably 5,000 square feet, so it's not like upstairs, downstairs. Mm -hmm. I, I embrace that. Why not? Nice. Yeah, you have to. Question, you get this amazing position. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get these positions before we're prepared for it. Right. Were you? Did you feel like, because you're getting thrust into, you're 19 years old. Right. You know? I, I was prepared for the position, but I wasn't prepared for the role. There's a difference. Meaning? The position means you are educated to do the job in that position. Mm -hmm. it means I understand fabric and how the business runs and the stock level and what I should order and what not to order and things of that nature. I wasn't prepared for the role of a young African-American man in that industry at Neiman Marcus. There's wow. a difference. It's a big difference. There was no people of color shopping in Neiman Marcus at that time. So it, that, that's what I mean, I wasn't prepared for the role. This is one of the questions I was mm -hmm. going to save for later. And mm -hmm. it, matter of mm -hmm. fact, I will, because it's so important that we speak about mm -hmm. people of color mm -hmm. in the fashion mm -hmm. industry. But we'll get to that um, a little later. Mm -hmm. Bring me up. How did you come to New York? Um, so one day in, in Neiman Marcus in, in the men's department, the escalator from upstairs goes right down into the men's department. So when you come down, you can see the entire men's department. Um, and I'm, you know, doing whatever I was doing at the time with other salespeople, whatever. Coming down the escalator, it was like 12 people mm -hmm. together. And one of them was Ralph Lauren. So I realized this is Ralph Lauren's team. So I walk right to the escalator as he's coming down. Mr. Lauren, I'm Jeffrey Tweedy. I'm the manager of the men's department. Can I show you your section, show you around? Because being in the, in the, in the fashion world as a salesperson, assistant manager, you're going to have the gift of gab because you're your first approach to any person walking in your, in your environment is, how are you today? May I help you? You gotta figure out some kind of conversation besides may I help you? What else is the thing that's gonna make them trigger to wanna have a conversation with you to sell them something, right? Yeah, so, go ahead. Go ahead. Go so ahead. I walked over to him and I showed him around and I was very knowledgeable of, the, of his business in that store, how much business he was doing dollar per square foot, what we needed more of, what was being marked down, what wasn't selling, who the cons consumer is that comes in our store. And what are the other things around him that's doing well and not doing well? So he said to me, what do you want to do? I said, what do you mean? He says, what would you like to do with your career? I said, I'd like to be in the fashion industry. He says, well, you got to be in New York City. He hands me a card from one of his assistants, like, give him a card. You know. I'm thinking, okay, big deal. He gives me a card and um, he said, let's keep in touch. We're going to get you in school. I'm like, okay. okay. Right? So he's, so... He's, he's basically, I'm going to get you in school. And I'm not thinking, I'm thinking, yeah, this guy, Ralph, oh, yeah, sure. He's going to take my call. That's not happening, right? So I think he was just being courteous, courtesy to me, courteous to me. And probably three months, four months. One thing that you, in, the, in the fashion industry, in working retail, you get in the habit of when you work with a, when you work with a person and you sell them $10,000 worth of product, or if you sell them $2,000 worth of product, one thing you always do is write notes. Mr. Smith, thank you very much for purchasing the shirt and tie. Look forward to seeing you next time you come in Neiman Markets. Um, whoever, you know, look forward to seeing you Christmas time. We have great cashmere sweaters coming in. I know you bought one of every one last year. New colors are coming in. You get in the habit of writing these wonderful notes. Still to this day, I write notes. So at the time, you also embracing the industry by reading everything about the industry from a distance. So you get DNR, which is the daily news record of the fashion industry. You get GQ, you get all these magazines, you get them, you get them. That's how I was living. I was teaching myself. Mm -hmm. And I would read, Ralph Lauren opens a new store in London. Ralph Lauren celebrates his 45th birthday, Ralph Lauren. So what I started to do was write notes. Mr. Lauren, congratulations on the new store in New York City, Jeff Tweedy. And I would send it to that card. Mr. Lauren, happy birthday on a birthday card. I would send them. So at the probably four months of this, and I call it stalking from a distance, <laughs> um, I get up enough nerve to call. Because at this time, the timing was that I knew I had to do something because school registration, I knew enough about college that it's time to start 
thinking about it mm -hmm. and how you get to New York to go to school. Cause I can't, if you don't do it now, I gotta wait another year. So I had to make a move. So I got up enough nerve to pick up the phone from the office, my office in the back of Neiman Marcus and call. And I, I mean, it was like, I was, I've never, I've never in my life been so nervous besides meeting Barack Obama. That moment, meeting Barack Obama was the most nervous part ever to pick up that phone and dial New York City. And first one, sure, let me put you through to the executive office. Okay, now I'm getting real nervous because you're not supposed to put me through. You're just supposed to take a message and keep it moving. Mm -hmm. Blow me mm -hmm. off and <laughs> there's some guy called and, and then they put me through the executive office. Then the executive office said, hold on, let me get you Mr. Lawrence's assistant. Now I'm going, like, this is like, real, really? This is really happening right now? And his assistant picks up, whose name was Claire at the time, says, Jeffrey, how are you? Hold on. Now I'm going, what the fuck is she doing? What does she mean? Hold on. <laughs> right? Mr. Lauren gets on the phone. I said, Mr. Lauren, I'm sorry to bother you. It's the Jeff Tweedy, the African-American gentleman you met at Neiman Marcus a while ago. Yeah, yeah, I remember you. Hold on, we're gonna get you in school. Right? So following, was me getting in school, Mr. Lauren getting me in school, a 20 minute interview, I'm in FIT. But what was amazing about that, what I didn't realize is that, um, and, I, and, I, and I speak about this sometimes, how we prepare ourselves for the opportunities, right? And I didn't realize I was preparing myself for the opportunity. The way I prepared myself for the opportunities was all the notes. So when you start to see that name over and over, Jeff Tweedy on a note, Jeff Tweedy on a, on a, on a birthday card, who gets all the notes and the cards? The, the assistant. assistant. There you go. So the assistant thought I was a friend. Oh, Jeff Tweedy, let me put you through. Because I see all these cars and notes you said, Mr. Lauren, you got to be a friend. Because <laughs> back then, there was no rock and roll designer that you really writing a note to. You got what I'm saying? You wasn't really, nobody in the industry was really writing Johnny Versace or George Armani a note to say, Absolutely. I admire what you do. Absolutely. You know? Um, and that's how it happened. And I'm in FIT now. You speak about preparation for opportunity. Mm -hmm. In listening to you, there was so much more. Mm -hmm. You being <clears throat> a young manager mm -hmm. at Neiman Marcus, mm -hmm. for anybody who's in the room, anybody who's watching this, you have to be prepared when opportunity yep. knocks, right? Uh. You see Ralph Lauren coming downstairs, mm -hmm. but you're not just, so often people, they want to introduce themselves, but mm -hmm. they, they, they have nothing behind them. Right, right. You knew everything mm -hmm. that was going mm -hmm. on in his department. Mm -hmm. You listed it all out, how much yeah. they were selling, yeah. Yeah. you know, what was moving, what was not moving. But more importantly, you were ready to mm -hmm. follow up with him. Mm -hmm. Handwritten notes, mm -hmm. which is so important mm -hmm. because, you know, at, at that time, I'm assuming it wasn't email. Mm -hmm. But nope. to get a handwritten note from somebody, right. it means something. It means you actually took the time. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just so great to hear that. You know, not only did you take advantage of the opportunity, mm -hmm. but you followed up yeah. on it. Oh. And at least you had some idea of what you wanted to mm -hmm. get out of that situation. Mm -hmm. And I think for anybody who's in this room, it's a, it, you can meet somebody any day of the week. But if you don't know what it is that you want out of the situation and how you can help them, it's pointless. You right. might as well save that right. for, you know, for mm -hmm. a different time. Right, right. NFIT. What's your first real job in the fashion industry? Not in retail, right. but actually working for a line. My first job was actually a gopher for Ralph Lauren, which was really? called internship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, that was my first job. I was cutting swatches in his office for women's, the women's collection. And I would cut swatches, I would put together a swatch book, I would do line sheets, I would prepare salespeople for sales meetings. That was my first job. And I would steam samples and get them organized for the buyers to come in. So yeah. now you're learning the other side of the game. You, right. you, you learn le retail, right. you understand that. I'm learning, I'm learning presentation right now. I'm learning how do you prepare yourself to present to someone to buy something from you. All in the presentation, right? And it, we went overboard in the presentation. Got you. That's very important. Got you. Yeah. From Ralph, mm -hmm. interning, did you get a full-time job or did you go to another line? No, I went from Ralph to I went from Ralph to um, East St. Laurent um, at Beatham in New York. And I went from there back to Ralph Lauren, then to Alexander Julian, 
from Alexander Julian to uh, Willie, where Willie Smith. Um, and then I went back to Ralph Lauren as uh, national sales manager of women's collection, which Tori Birch actually worked for me back then. Yeah, she was wow. my salesperson. She used to handle Bertolt Goodman and Sachs for me. Wow. So we used to sell the high end women's collection, um, um, Ralph's runway women's stuff. And then I left there, which people couldn't believe to go start Spike Lee's and Spike Lee's joint, 40 Acres of the Mule product. People couldn't that. believe that. that people were like, you losing your mind to go leave Ralph Lauren to go that. But the reason I did it was that it was a startup. Ralph is, was about, uh, Ralph, Spike was about to do Malcolm X, the movie, and he wanted to do movie paraphernalia. paraphernalia. So he, um, found me through the neighborhood of Brooklyn and said, I heard good things about you. And I had no idea what I was gonna do with him. Um, but I knew it was a startup, so it was me doing everything from design to production to costing to getting it made, getting it made and how to ship it, how to ship it to consumers, I mean, to stores, understanding UPC coding, understand all the operation of warehousing. And that was really important for me to get to learn all that. You're going from high-end brands, established brands, yeah. to startups, yeah. but you're ready. Yeah. You're also going white mm -hmm. to now the African-American yeah. fashion designers mm -hmm. are coming on the scene. Mm -hmm. What does that transition look like for you? Um, it was interesting. My, my background of working at Ralph Vaughan, and I forgot the other one, was Hugo Balls, was people saw that as... He's an African-American guy that had experience in that world. Um, and when we started Sean John, it was 36 designers um, that was out there the same time we were. Uh, and, but, I, but I think what the difference was, and I'm not, I'm not patting myself, but the difference was why most of those brands don't exist anymore was that I took Ralph Vaughan's blueprint of what he established, which was Puff and I established um, can, having, can we hold off on, sure, on, on, sure, on the sure, show, yeah, yeah. because yeah. I think it's important <laughs> now. You spoke about Willie Ware. Right. Now you're speaking about um, Spike Lee. Right. And I remember very well when um, Malcolm X came out and right. how dope those X right. hats were. Right. You know, and you're coming into, th th at this point, are you understanding that there's this white space yeah, in the well, marketplace? Well, one of the things that Ralph Lauren when I, when I came back to Ralph Lauren, I was the East Coast Regional Manager of um, Ralph Lauren's collection, which is his high-end collection. And again, Tory worked for me. Um, I had a, it, it was a little difficult, because I noticed that when I would present with Barney's or Bertolf Goodman or Saks Fifth Avenue or Neiman Marcus buyers, they would sit in a chair like, as I'm having my meeting with them. They didn't come forward. They didn't care. They were like, who is this? Why is he presenting? Who is he? And where's the other girls, the, the deputants that we work with in the, in the past with the blue eyes and the blonde hair? Why are they not in front of me? So what I had to do was not get angry. I started reading. I started reading books. One of the books I, uh, I wrote, I mean wrote, I wish I wrote it. I uh, started reading was the uh, miseducation of the, miseducation of the black man, of the Negro, right? Negro. Negro. So I read that, it was a few other books I read, and I, and I understood the mentality I had to deal with. So I reversed it. And I went back to some of my um, learnings in the past of how I approach Ralph Lauren. And it was really how, to, and how you approach customers. It was really how do you have a conversation that's a neutral conversation. That's not black, white, and it's not fashion, but how do you just, how do you engage that person to make them move forward to want it? It took me probably about three months, four months to get to that point where I had, I had them eating out of my hand. They were, they, they were looking forward to meeting with me because I, I just knew what to say and how to say it. I didn't change who I was. That ain't happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I just took a different approach. It wasn't, the first conversation wasn't about me selling you something. The first conversation might have been about your family and knowing what, who my family is and where I came from. And they embraced that because now it's, a, it's an open book. Now it's like, oh. Okay, now I know where, where this guy's from and how he got here and who he is and why he's in front of me, right? So I, it took me a while, but it was, it was, it was difficult, but it wasn't, it wasn't that it was uncontrollable. It, wasn't, it could be controlled is what mm -hmm, I'm getting mm -hmm. at. And it was much like what it is now, but I, I dealt with that.
Before you and Puff embarked on this amazing, you know, highly successful Sean John brand, did you understand that, look, there's a void in the marketplace right mm -hmm. now? Urban designers, mm -hmm. you know, you had Willie Ware, mm -hmm. you had Walker Ware, you had mm -hmm. Cross Colors, mm -hmm. Carl Kanai, mm -hmm. you know, those guys had come and they had mm -hmm. gone. Mm -hmm. But the marketplace was ready for something that was high-end, mm -hmm. urban mm -hmm. lifestyle. Right. How do you and Puff come together? Um, I didn't know Puff. Um, I knew who he was. He was a hot producer at the time, but I didn't know much about him. I would come in. I had an apartment in New York, and I had an apartment in L.A. at the time. But I was, I didn't know. I would see him out, but I didn't know him. So one day, um, in my L.A. apartment, I get a call. Hey, it's Puff. I need to speak to you. And it was like he called me for like a week, and I didn't call him back for like three weeks. <laughs> because at the time, my mom was ill in D.C., so I didn't really want to work, and I didn't need to work, so mm -hmm. I just chilled and I wanted to focus on my mom. Um, and I didn't want to. I didn't, and, and by the way, I didn't want to start a new company. It's a lot of work to start a new company. And I finally met with him, and he, and he talked to me about his vision and why it's different from everyone else's. And, and I was like, okay, it sounds cool. I'll get back to you. He's like, is this a phone conversation? No, this is, per, this is, is at BMG. Okay. <laughs> um, and he's like, so I just gave you two minutes of my shit, and you're going to tell me you got to get back to me? I was like, <laughs> yeah, I got to get back to you. I'm not sure if I want to do this. Now, at the same time, Damon John, who I admire for what he's done at FUBU, um, was courting me also. And I basically signed a term sheet with him to be the president of FUBU. Um, and the way Puff got my name was actually because they said it, uh, Damon and his partner said it. Puff's first meeting with Sean John was to meet with Damon John, of course, brothers, to say, I want to start a new fashion company. How do I do it? Damon made the mistake of saying, Oh, Jeff Tweedy, this guy Jeff Tweedy is about to start with us. He can do this FUBU and this. He's great. This he's this. Puff, he's Ralph man. Lauren. He's this. <laughs> this so, guy. so Puff is taking this all in. He's, he told me this story. He's taking it all in. Next thing you know, he had Norma track down who this Jeff Tweedy guy is. And that's how it happened. And I had to call Damon up one day and be like, listen, I, I don't know what to tell you. But I, <laughs> and this was, like, this was like easily six months before I took the job. Is and, FUBU still... Hot out there at this time, or are they on the No, they they hot. They're on they're fire. Hot. The, the, the problem that Damon had, and he realized it, was that he had a $194 million company, very profitable, but they had no structure. And what I mean by structure, they had no blueprint, they had no feelings of where they wanted to go. They couldn't see a three year plan, they couldn't even see a three month plan. And you would go see Fubo in these stores, they didn't even have a sign because the stores didn't pay them any respect, they just wanted to sell them. They didn't have a shop. They had nothing. They didn't know licensing. They didn't know how to do boys. They didn't know how to do outerwear. They didn't know how to do fragrance. They didn't know how to extend the brand. And that's what they wanted me to do, is extend the brand and grow the brand. Um, and Damien knew he needed someone with, the, with that expertise and had structure in their life that knew how to do that. If you don't mind me asking, besides the check, mm -hmm. what did Diddy offer you? What was the deciding factor that you said, I'm going to go with him instead of Fubu? I don't know, it really wasn't a check. I gotta be honest with you. I, I, you know, this may sound crazy, I know y'all, but I don't really, my girlfriend's probably like, you crazy. <laughs> but I don't really, I don't really, I don't do it for money. I do it for passion, man. My mother always told me, if you're passionate about something, you do a great job, you're gonna get a check, you're gonna get paid. Now, money is important, don't get me wrong. Uh, but it, I didn't make a deciding factor on the money part. Because uh, so Puff gave it? me whatever I wanted. I, I think it was really, the idea of I didn't want to walk into an environment at FUBU where he already had people in place and partners in place as his backers. I didn't want to deal with that. Because right? I didn't want to deal with what I had to deal with at, at, at Ralph Lauren. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going back to dealing with that again if I don't have to. What Puff, would offer, Puff offered me was that there was no company. You are the company, Jeff. You, do what, you structure it the way you want. You bring in a design team the way you want. You find the operation. You find who's going to make the product overseas for us. You do it all. And that's, that was um, good for me. Um, and it was a great opportunity for me. Did you see the vision right away? I, Puff is one of those people who he'll give you 15 different visions. So you got to bring it and figure out how you 
manage it and how you put structure behind and vision behind the vision, right? <laughs> or put a plan behind the vision. He didn't have that, so I was able to do that. And it really was, you know, what I did with Puff was I took what he did in entertainment and combined it with fashion, and we coined the word fashiontainment. And he understood that. He said, okay, I got that. The other thing I did in simplicity form was that we started Sean John for the guy who has started his first bank account mm -hmm. as opposed to other brands where for the guy that had all his money in his front pocket. There's a difference. It's a big difference. Big difference, right? So when you talk about an aspirational brand, I'm dealing with the, the young man who has his first apartment on his own. He might have his first luxury car. He might have his used BMW, but he knows where he's trying to go to. The other guys, the Rockaway, the FUBU guys, and those kind of brands, it was the guy that had all his money in his front pocket. He didn't see the vision. He didn't see three years, four years, five years down the road. That's and that was, that's what was the difference between us. And we were able to do that. Um, and that was sort of our, I mean, there was, there was other um, uh, strategies behind it, but that was really how we saw things. That was a front-end strategy. That was a front-end strategy. Yeah. And okay. also, I was able to use Ralph Lauren's blueprint of what Ralph Lauren really does is he makes you believe that that polo shirt that you wear for $79 is different from the one that you can get at Target at $9.99. It's through the marketing lenses, right? And that's what he was able to do. He makes you feel like if you wear Ralph Lauren anything, that you have millions of dollars, and people really think that they have millions of dollars, all kinds of Mercedes, and your wife rides around on horses butt ass naked all the time. <laughs> because that's what, he, that's what he instills in you. So I say to myself, but that's great marketing, right? So how do, we, how do I turn that with Puff? And what we did was, I took with Puff what he had in Jennifer at the time, and the way Puff partied, and the way, Jennifer Puff, Lopez, yeah, I'm assuming. The way Puff partied, and the way Puff carried himself, we made that a lifestyle. So Ralph Lyon had this lifestyle. We had a separate lifestyle that was aspirational, that was understandable for our consumer. And that's how we, did it. we built it. I want to go back to the beginnings of Sean John. Mm -hmm. And you, you just gave us so much food for thought in terms of strategy, mm -hmm. in terms of vision, in terms of being able to put a strategy mm -hmm. behind the vision. Mm -hmm. But when I met you, you were sitting in a cubicle. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for people who are watching this and mm -hmm. those in the studio audience to understand you built Sean John into a $400, $500 mm -hmm. million dollar business. Yep. But it started with you, mm -hmm. I remember vividly. <laughs> 33rd floor. In a cubicle yep. huh. with no staff Nothing. at that time. Yep. And I think people have to understand you have to start somewhere, right. you know, yep. and, and, and you have to humble yourself. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a little while ago you had a home in New York, mm -hmm. home in L.A. Right. And you still humbled yourself. Hey, right. I have to start mm -hmm. this brand. Right. I have to do the heavy lifting. Right. It's me who's going to be right. mailing out mm -hmm. boxes. It's me who's going to be cutting mm -hmm. swatches. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right. Because you have to see the upside of things. And, and, and I didn't need to have it right now. I saw it, I saw the, the, the money that, that would come, but I didn't need to have it right now. So you're right, I was in a cubicle, no bigger than this, and, and Puff used to say, we was in the BMG building, and he wasn't really allowed to have that space for me, so anybody came by, I would be like, oh, this is just tour merchandise. <laughs> <laughs> you know? What was interesting is that I would come get in the office at 8.30, leave at six. You know, in the music industry, I'm in the cubicle, Puff's office is like right there. So, you know, at, from six o'clock on is when every celebrity and every artist would walk through. And I would leave 30 hats out on the desk, you remember that, right? And they were all colors. There was one Sean John had black with white, red with yellow, da, da, da. And I would leave, I would come in in the morning, I'd be like, yo, all the hats are gone. <laughs> and Puff said something very interesting to me. He said, how many are missing? I said like, I don't know, like 10 out of 15. He goes, well, whatever colors people didn't take, let's not make them. <laughs> and I was like, he's got a, he's got a good point. It's got a good point. So yeah, it was, it was a t-shirt and a hat that started it. I think it's interesting <clears throat> because every line has a signature product. Right. You guys came out the gate with what? What is it that set it, it was off? That black, it was the black hat with the white script. It was the black hat with the white script? That was it. And then the first collection was only seven pieces. It was the black hat with the white script, the t-shirt that matched, it was a pair of jeans. It was the raw 
uh, denim jacket with a raw jean. It was the velour suit. And Stop it was, there. And it was a cover-up. Because that's where I was trying to go. Yeah. Love the black hat. Yeah. Remember Sean John shirt, mm -hmm. New York, Paris, yeah. whatever yeah. on the back. Yeah. But that velour suit yeah. was the crazy. That was crazy. it. Crazy. Yeah. And, and we still, and we bought that back. We bought that back for our 20th anniversary last year, and, and it's at Bloomingdale's now. It's at Bloomingdale's is at Macy's, and it still gets it. We, we just introduced that again this holiday in like six new colors. Like, that's just like... But funny story to tell you how Puff is. I mean, he, and this guy, that's what I love about him. He, he just has this, like, the way he picks it up on, on music and sound and stuff, he picks it up like that in fashion. So when we started doing velour suits, and I didn't Whose really, idea was that? Puffs, for sure. We started doing velour suits, and he was like, it's a certain velour you have to get. I was like, okay, velour is velour, is velour. And we was like, no. And I showed him like 10 different velours, the design team. Was, no, that's not it. Y'all have to go get the original, original Fila velour suit. The one made in Italy, not the one made in China. I'm like, how does he know this? <laughs> and he's right. So. Back then, you could only find the one that was made in China. The one in Italy was only sold in New York City in this place in Queens at this Russian sports store. It was where these guys would go in and all they would get was sweatsuits. There was no brothers in there, just Russians buying sweatsuits. So I go in, 9 o'clock, 9.30 in the morning, the guy's opening the gate up. And I said, do you have the feeler? He was like, yeah, we carry those. We're the only one that carry those. <laughs> I brought it back. I was like, that's it. That's the one I'm talking about. And that, that's what it was. You can't even find that suit no more from Fila. They don't even make them. Because it was made in Italy. The fabric is a very difficult fabric to make. Because you got to get that shimmer. It's got to hit a certain way. It's got to be the right blend. And those kinds of things is what I love about Puff is that he's, he's that detailed person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, it's not. Watch when it hits the light. It's not doing the right thing I wanted to do. Like, that level of detail. Level of detail, yeah. But oh. that's, what, that's what was good about it. You talk about fashion taming. Mm -hmm. in, in so many ways, I guess, you know, Puff coming from the music industry, I remember the early product placement mm -hmm. that you guys had on Sean John. Mm -hmm. At that time, Arsenio Hall was mm -hmm. on the air. Mm -hmm. And um, I can remember you mm -hmm. saying, we're going we're gonna to have the band members. Do mm -hmm. you remember this conversation? Yep. Yeah. The it, band members were it, wearing that T-shirt, that first T-shirt. Yep. Mm -hmm. How important was product placement? Because I don't, I'm not even sure if you guys were in stores at that time or if you were just seeding the product out there. We seeded the product. We, we created the demand for it. Um, so when it hit the stores, it was like unbelievable. When I was, a, I used, one of my stunts while I was in LA was I was helping Carl Kanai with Carl Kanai mm -hmm. when he restarted up. We went out of business for him and I, I was partnered with Carl Kanai for about two years on the West Coast. And one of the things that Carl did, which was genius, when Carl and I started his own brand, stores wouldn't give him any play. He would have one store in Brooklyn, one in LA, and that was it. They were like, we don't carry that kind of stuff. We don't carry that kind of stuff. So Carl did something genius. He placed two ads in Source Magazine. And what he did was available at Dr. J's, available at Macy's. It wasn't in those stores. But what happened when people would call up, he would call two weeks later to Macy's and say, hi, I'm Carl Kanai. They'd be like, oh, we've been looking for you. People have <laughs> been calling for your stuff. Brilliant. So it was, it was marketing. Brilliant. Marketing. And I just think sometimes we just have, the, we have that knack of like not giving up. And he didn't give up. He just said, I'm going to take out my own money and place an ad. Y'all are going to see what I can do and see the response you get. And he got a great response. That's how he started his brand. So by the time you guys got in store, Sean John, it is obviously you're building a demand for it. Mm -hmm. Did it hit off the bat? Hit off or the bat. It hit off the yeah, bat. Yeah, the first store we, we, we launched the brand with Bloomingdale's and then Atrium and then Macy's and other stores. It hit right away. It hit right away. Because the difference was, I think the consumer was this young African American man was sick of the big logos. Keep in mind, at the time you had Mecca, you had Fubu, you had Academics, you had. Rockaway, you had all these big logos. We came with the three and a half inch small. We, take, we tightened the fit up so it wasn't big and baggy. It was clean, it was respectful. And that's what it was for us. So there, was, there was a difference there. And also we had, a, we had a, a plan, we had a strategy. It wasn't about, you know, 
one of our models that we live by, that we built the company on was, you know, um, don't chase the paper, chase the dream. Other companies chased the paper, and other, those other companies were not African American owned. This was Puff's money. The other companies were not there. Funded. Even Rock, Jay had a partner who was Russian. FUBU had two other partners. They wasn't, they was about, let's get that money. And the other thing was Puff's name. Sean John is his name. So it had to be treated in, with certain, you know, kid gloves. Because it's not just a random name or random something you put on a sweatshirt. So it was a little different. You just mentioned so many brands that I forgot even existed, you know, but were huge back in the days. Yeah. You guys just celebrated your 20th year anniversary. Mm -hmm. What is the secret sauce for anybody who is thinking about starting a brand? How, how did you stay around for so long? I think, you know, I meet a lot of people when I speak and, and everyone wants to get into fashion industry and I have a sweatshirt and I have this and I have that. You, you got to ask yourself, um, with any product or anything you develop, is there a demand for it, first of all? And who wants it? And why do they want it? Because um, everyone thinks they're a genius and dream about something, right? But we created a demand for it. Um, and I think that uh, uh, it was a story behind it. It was marketing behind it. Um, and I think you got to think about that when you create a brand or create anything you do, whether it's a, a cookbook or whatever. Who wants it? Who needs it? What's the white space? Is that already out there? You gotta ask yourself those questions. And sometimes it's a bad idea. Correct, correct. <laughs> so Sean John comes out, out it's rocket fuel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, now you're chasing it, mm -hmm. right? You're mm -hmm. trying to keep up with demand. Mm -hmm. I think one of the crowning moments, and I don't wanna speak for you, mm -hmm. but you were able to get Sean John into the Mercedes-Benz fashion world. Mm -hmm. What was that moment like? Because that's a big moment. Yeah, that's, that's, you're, you're doing a fashion show the same week as Marc Jacobs and Prada and Donna Karen and Calvin Klein and all those brands. Um, wh what we did was when we talked about being in the fashion industry, one thing I asked Puff to do was go to every fashion show he possibly could. And the reason I asked him to do that, he was even like, why am I going to fashion? For what reason? I said, I want you to prepare yourself for the fashion industry the same way I prepare myself. And I tell him the whole story. What, what you were doing and what I explained to him, what he was doing was he was embracing the industry, right? So when it was time for you to come out with your clothing line, everyone's going, oh, that's why he was at the fashion show. That's why he sat back and took notes of what was done in Paris and what was done here and what was done there. So they, they embraced him. They allowed him in the industry um, because we took that time. Getting in the Mercedes, Ben's Fashion Week was, was um, it's a money thing, don't get me wrong, those shows cost a lot of money, but it was, they needed some excitement to the industry. Um, it wasn't, you know, at the time, there's not a lot of designers that was doing anything exciting. And they knew Puffs, again, our lifestyle was that lifestyle, party, the, the sexiness, the, the, the aroma of how you look and what you're wearing and all of that. So all of that was, they needed that. One of, the, one of our main quotes that was from Anna Winter when we started the brand was that Sean John brings excitement back to the men's industry. And that was true. There was nothing out there that was really like, you know, our fashion shows was you, people waiting around the corner to get mm -hmm. in line to these fashion shows. I mean, it was a, it was a moment. I um, mean, I, you know, I never got a, uh, yeah, just, whatever, just so you yeah. know. But I mean, one, we, we, we used to have. I, I was our, one of those people. <laughs> I mean, at, at our fashion shows, front row was Roberto Cavalli, Giorgio Armani was Tommy Hilfiger, Anna Winter, Naomi Campbell was front row. They wanted to come see the show. They wanted to pay homage. Like, wait, I, I, wait, I think wait. That that's we got a request from who? Roberto Cavalli wants to come to our show? That's got to be such a surreal come moment on. for you. It, it has to be. Yeah, it, it, it is. But it, it was like, um, but you have to, how, how do I say this? You have to take it in and take it for what it's worth. You still have to do business. Mm -hmm. This is exciting, but how do I translate this into business, into opportunities, into dollars and cents to grow my brand? I can't get caught up because Roberto Cavalli's here. He's not doing anything for me. You're having these huge milestones. Mm -hmm. Can you explain 
first off, what did it, what the CFDA award mm -hmm. and FIFA awards mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. and what it's like to be the recipient right. of these awards. The CFDA award is the is the sort of Oscars of the fashion industry. is the is the apex of the in the, fa the award that you can possibly get. It stands for Council of Fashion of Designers, and that year we were nominated, and it's a big event. It's red carpet. It's beyond. It's a big event. Um, we were nominated four times in a row. We were becoming the Susan Lucci of like <laughs> the fashion industry, and it got to a point where Puff and I would be in the car. He would jot down, and I would give him some notes for a speech, and he would add to it. And I remember one time, two times, he was sitting in front of me, and they would announce the winner. He would have the speech in his hand. They would announce the winner, and he would go and hand it back to me after we lost. <laughs> and I kept all those speeches. It's funny. I have, still have those. But the one year that we wasn't prepared, we had no speech prepared, that we won the award. Um, and, that was, and we beat out Mark Jacobs and Prada that year. No, we beat out Ralph Lauren and Prada that year. I'm sorry. Incredible. That was incredible. And the Fifi is a, a fragrance award that they give every year. And uh, we won that twice for I Am King and Unforgivable. And this is, this is, this is history. Like you, this is major. You know, somewhere on that CFDA wall of awards is Sean John. And it's a beautiful award. It is. It is a beautiful award. Nice. Yeah. Speak to me, you know, Sean John, and what year is this that you guys won the um, CFDA? 2004. So you guys are in business now five years. Mm hmm Yep. This is We got nominated the first year for it. I think it was called like the Young Perry Ellis Award. The second year was the Menswear Designer of the Year Award. Third year was the Menswear Designer of the Year Award. Fourth year was the Menswear Designer of the Year Award. So we got nominated a few times. Yeah. So we're speaking about all the highs. Every business goes through rocky points. Mm -hmm. Every business goes through mm -hmm. challenges. Mm -hmm. So in 20 years, I have mm -hmm. to imagine you've been through the ups, you've mm -hmm. been through the downs, you've mm -hmm. made hundreds of millions, mm -hmm. you've made less than that. Mm -hmm. How, what are some of the challenges that you guys faced and that anybody who's starting a line would face, mm -hmm. and how did you make it through those rough times? Well, the challenges that you have is that how do you stay true to your, your vision and your dream and your strategy? And very few people, companies can do that without being public. Ralph Lauren is a public company. George Armani is a public company. Um, Tommy Hilfiger is now a public company. But Tommy had tough times, too, in 2000. In 96, I'm sorry, 96, 98, he had a very tough time where he was almost out of business. But um, so you have to, how do you, how do you maintain your um, flexibility of having capital to run your business as well as staying true to your vision and your strategy? Sometimes you have to veer from that. And, and we had to veer from that in 2008, 2009. The market was difficult. And uh, everybody understood it was like recession. And we started lowering our prices and doing stuff that wasn't the normal stuff we were doing. And it was like, we were listening too much to the retailer. The retailer is dictating to us what we need to be doing and we had to get away from it. So we took a step back in 2009 and 10 and just regroup in 11 and just regrouped. And we had to figure it out. And we, we weren't public, it was Puff's money. It wasn't like we had, we were, you know, it's interesting. We, we sit next to Calvin Klein who's, uh, uh, um, who's owned by a, $18 billion company. We sit next to Levi, who's a $25 billion company. We sit next to um, uh, Tommy Hilfiger, who's a billion dollar company. So it's all this public money with just me and Puff. So it's like, you know, we, we got to a point where, you know, Calvin Klein would launch a new denim collection. They would spend $40 million on that launch of that campaign, new billboards, this, that. We would spend $400,000. <laughs> so, so we had to look outside. We had to look to our loyal customer and stay focused on our loyal customer and build that loyalty first and not worry about the rest. That will always be there as a loyal customer. And even to this day, that's why we're able to do suits and dress shirts and ties because that loyal customer has been with us for a long time. Can we speak about some of your licenses? Because sure. over the years, you've made some really smart decisions mm -hmm. as an executive, as mm -hmm. a president of the company. Mm -hmm. You've licensed, <clears throat> you know, Outerwear, yep. watches. Yep. Um, now it's loungewear. Home L loungewear now. Home we just we just launched this, which is doing very well. Eyewear, which is a eyewear is an eight million dollar company. Uh, optical, optical, yeah, wow. eyewear. Um, kids, of course, outerwear, uh, fragrance, of course, suits, dress shirt, ties. Am I missing anything? I might be missing a few, but we we basically have really created a true lifestyle brand. 
Now, is this also part of the vision? Because, you know, sometimes people, they, they, they want to blow too quick. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. They don't capture their core consumer. Mm -hmm. Did you guys wait? We did. And you did? We waited because um, one of the things, we waited for the right time, and we waited for the demand. We waited for people to say, how come y'all don't do? When can I get it? And it took a while for me to explain the, and explain to Puff what licensing meant. Because we were doing everything ourselves. So he was like, well, Jeff, why can't we make our own jackets, our own coats, Jeff, our own suits? Jeff, you don't mind me interjecting, yeah. but for, for our audience, what does licensing mean? Licensing is when you take your, your name and you allow another company to utilize your name on other products. Um, but what we did is that we made sure we had a contract that was 62 pages long that they couldn't sneeze <laughs> without us knowing about it. We wanted to protect our name. And what, that's what we did. When we first did deals with people, and the first deal we did was with boys, they couldn't believe what was in the contract. And we said, we're not doing this deal if it's not done this way. And we protect the brand. That's one way to do that. Because you don't, you don't want to license your name on and let people just do whatever they want. We have, we have a, someone in my office that is responsible for monitoring and approving every piece of product. Even to this day, we approve every piece of product. So everything's being made, I see. Everything. Everything. Because you have to, because otherwise you can't trust that company to go just, all of a sudden I got some pink suits out there <laughs> that, with purple lines running through them because the retailer says we can sell those and they decide to do them. No, we're not doing that. Can we speak about your fragrance? Yes. Um, licensing? Mm -hmm. Because I thought, <clears throat> you know, you can hit it out the park in fashion. Fragrance is subjective. Right. Does it smell Very good? Much. Does it not smell yep. good? Yep. You guys came out the box right. with unforgivable. But I, I got another one for you. Go Fragrance ahead. smells differently on different skin. So you're right. You, you, it's, it's, a, it's tough to do. Mm -hmm. It's very tough to do. Where did the scent for Unforgivable come from? Because to this day, I still own. Um, that was really a puff thing. I did the deal with um, Leonard Lauder, the owner of, the, of Estee Lauder. Mm -hmm. um, and I put in, in marketing is everything, right? So the way I got this deal, so you can imagine me um, meeting with Leonard Lauder, who's president of Estee Lauder, which is probably, I don't know, they got to be $50 billion company and seven people in the room. John Dempsey, who runs Mac. Um, and I presented to them our brand by myself. And what I did was that Puff taught me one thing, marketing is important. Getting attention is very important. So there was this, y'all remember the, um, oh, what was the name of that? Uh, uh, oh, it was Pat, the, the, uh, what's that show? Um, oh, the Osbournes, right? Do you remember the Osbournes, the show? So there was a clip um, on the Osbournes one time that Puff told me about, and the mother's lying, lying in bed, and she's, the daughter's sitting in the chair next to her, and they're going through a magazine, and they're just talking on Osbournes, because it's a reality show, right? And the daughter goes, I saw a Puff last night at a party, almost, his security almost knocked me down, right? And they're just talking. And the mother goes, you know what I love Puff Daddy? He always smells so good, <laughs> right? So that was the end of my presentation. So I put that in my presentation. They nice, were like, I nice. love it. We love nice, this. Let's go. Nice. But you can look at numbers and you can look at the distribution. You can look at what we've accomplished. But until you can say your name is now on TV, is now and the Osbournes are talking about just a whole nother level. You look at the Carly uh, Jenner, who, Jenner, who just sent, signed a $600 million deal. That's unheard of with Cody. $600 million, $600 million. to own 51% of her company. That's major, major. So the fragrance was really created by Puff. Uh, he has a nose, a, a nose for that. Um, it was time consuming because he's, he's looking at a lot of notes to develop that uh, and bring it all together. And, and it's the marketing behind it was genius what he did. And it was unforgivable. And we, he did that photo shoot with Michael Thompson. Um, and it was him just with the girl and it would, just took off. Did it he was name amazing. It? He named it. Really? Yeah, he named it. Puff names all the fragrance. We're, we're launching another one um, next uh, July, June, July, we, another one we're launching that we're working on right now. Nice. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned early, and I want to take a step back because I think it's important because a lot of people who are watching this, mm -hmm. they, they, they look up to you. 
If you're starting a line, how important is it to travel? You mentioned Italy fashion. Mm -hmm. You know, we, is it important to see the world before you start a line, or is it more important to just understand who you're marketing your line to? Both. And, really? You have to, you, listen, you have to know the, the landscape of what your competition is and what's happening out there, right? Um, so you have to study it and understand it. The internet puts you right there. You don't really have to travel. The internet puts you right there. But if you want to get into business and whatever your product is, know the, know the landscape, know the platform, know what other people are doing. What's, what's, why do you think this product is important to whomever you're trying to reach? We call it the white space in, um, in the fashion industry. What is the white space that's not there right now that, that, that is needed? And you have to really ask yourself, and a lot of people are not truthful with themselves. They really have to ask because they're so excited about that business and getting started. They have to be truthful with themselves and test it out on people. Test it out on people that's not your aunts, uncles, cousins, your brothers and sisters. Go to real people and say, what do you think? You know, we test our fragrance out really in Brooklyn mm -hmm. on Flatbush Avenue right here. We test it there. We test it on 125th Street. We test it in Atlanta at Lenox Mall. We'll take a thing, a little, you've seen it, a little vial, and we'll spray people. And real people, what do you think? What do you think? That's the, that's the real opinion. That's the real opinion. Right? So we do that. So before we put the next fragrance out, we'll have people out there for three, four days. What do you think? And we'll write, they'll write down the comments. Because that's real. No. It's the real, real. We yeah. can't get no realer than that. Right? Because other ways that people test products, I'm talking about testing of products, but you can obviously hire a focus group if you have money to do that. But if you don't, test it on people randomly what do you think of this what do you think of that they're going to tell you the real truth you've done a deal with john wall mm -hmm. you've done with dj mustard mm -hmm. and so many others mm -hmm. how do you in particular keep your finger on the pulse stay ahead of the game in terms of what's hot who's going to be hot what's next who do i need to put my clothes on see that guy back there with the gray sweatshirt that's my son, Miles. Then when he gets in my car and he tells me music mm -hmm. and he says, Dad, this person, like he, I told him the other day I could have had baby. You want me, baby. Mm -hmm. He bought me baby. And I passed on baby. I was like, <laughs> he's like, Dad, you passed on baby. Remember I told you about baby? You know, so he, he, he's ahead of that game. He so, told me about, what's the guy at New Orleans Saints? I mean, New Orleans Pelicans? Zion, he told me about Zion probably six years ago. He's like, Dad, watch this guy. He's going to be a beast. Here he is. So fortunately, I have two sons who really keep the pulse. But it's also having the right um, team around you mm -hmm. um, that is, is passionate about the industry, that's living fashion and living the lifestyle. Um, trust me, because, you know, Ralph Vaughn is not um, – someone's telling Ralph Vaughn what watch to put on when they shoot him. Rather, it's the AP. Ralph, you got to wear the new AP. That's the new watch. You got to put that on. He, you think he really knows what an AP is? And that's the reason I'm so asking. You got, so you got to have the right team around you that's, that keeps you abreast of things. And that's important. Yeah, because fashion is ever-changing. Yep. Yep. And yep. more important, fashion, for mm -hmm. people who don't know, mm -hmm. you are a couple of seasons ahead. We're, we're, we're basically, we start developing nine months before it hits the stores. Nine months out before it hits the store. So you always have to have your finger on the pulse yeah. of what's going to be next. It's risky because you things could turn real fast. Mm -hmm. um, it's risky, but you, what you try to do, and we've been blessed enough to have a consumer that's twenty years with us that we know his his lifestyle, we know his, his demographic, we know his psychographic, we know how he shops, what he likes. We have all those all those uh, the data on that on that customer. So that's important. You did an exclusive deal with Macy's. Mm -hmm. Why and how did it benefit the company? That was in 2008-9. It helped us. When, okay. the, when, the, when, the, when the business was difficult through our relationships, Puff and my relationships with Jeff Gannett and Terry Lunger, who was the chairman and president at the time, we did a deal with them. And it was an exclusive deal, which was saved us, to be honest with you. Really That's when the majority of the companies went out of business in 2007, 8, and 9. Because a lot of specialty stores closed. A lot of those mom and pop specialty stores that helped brands closed. Um, the record company was tough. Um, it was just a lot going on. And we, we signed that deal basically knowing that we have a home now. We have a home. But I got to believe that it's, it's still a challenge because you have space within Macy's, but so does Ralph. Right. 
so does Calvin right. Klein. Your budgets are not as big. Right. How do you compete? Um, we don't look to compete, to be honest. We look to manage our expectations of our business. I don't think I'm ever going to be a billion dollar company, and that's okay. I could be very profitable at 300 million, very profitable, and I'm okay with that. So you manage your expectations. So I'm not necessarily going to get the biggest billboard when you get off the plane in Vegas and you see five of them that got Ralph on them. But that's okay. I have a loyal customer that's been with me for 20 years, and I know exactly what he wants from me and when he's going to buy it and how he's going to buy it and where to shop for it. So that's important. That's important. You don't always have to have the biggest business. You don't always have to compete. But know your space, know your lane, and live in that lane, and that's okay. Within the last couple of years, you guys sold mm -hmm. a piece of the business. Mm -hmm. You being there at the start, can you talk to me? Because I think one of the mistakes so many entrepreneurs make is they're personally attached to the brand, mm -hmm. right? and they might miss their window yep. to sell. Mm -hmm. What made you guys decide this is the time? Mm -hmm. And how has it worked for you since then? Right. It, you're right. People do miss their opportunity. And, and I, you never should fall in love with a product. You never should. That's a great job. You never fall in love with a product because you develop a product. Which, what happens a lot of times, people start companies and they develop product and they develop it out of love. First thing they say is because I love this product. but it's going to come a time where someone's going to offer you money for that love and you have to part with it. You have to divorce that love mm -hmm. and figure out what's the next steps. And we, um, the time for us was really not about the money. It was about another company that could give me more exposure. We did it for the exposure. So we quickly, within six months, signed a deal with China. Worldwide, I mean, rights for all of China. We're looking at now South America. We're looking at different deals for us. And that's what we needed. We didn't have that bandwidth to take us to the international market. We've never done anything in the international market. Sean John in never. 18 years. Never. Never done anything. And the reason we did it, going back to protecting the brand, mm -hmm. we didn't give our licensing partners uh, in that contract the rights to sell international. Because again, I'm not gonna let you take my brand international into the wrong place. Because that destroys the brand totally. So if you, if I, imagine if I let the suit guy go and start selling somebody randomly and in China or South America, and it's in the wrong stores. I'm done as far as being in that country. Done, because the brand is garbage now. So we held off. And we did, it's not like we lost money. We didn't know, it was, there was no money to be had. We didn't, it wasn't a vision anyway. The vision was to get it right here. And now, with that being said, again, we prepared ourselves. The, the deal that we signed in, with China was a very lucrative deal for us. So is China? China. Is China the most profitable country outside of the U.S.? China, interesting, by, by 2023, LMVH, I think it's 68% of LMVH's business will be out of China. Wow. 68% by two, uh, 2023, I think the number was. China has the largest consumer right now in any luxury brand. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's crazy. So when you talk about opening up your distribution, it's China, it's South America, is where you want to be. Again, for so many people who are watching this, they're mm -hmm. looking at you and they're trying to get gems because they want to start mm -hmm. their own line. I know mm -hmm. you recently just launched your e-commerce business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How important is e-commerce in 2020 mm -hmm. as opposed to retail? It's important. It's very important. What e-com does for you is allows you to um, Present your own vision in your own words. When someone clicks on it, your vision is your words. There's no buffer in between the way stores can present it. Um, you're presenting it. Uh, also, um, the profitability part of it is your margins are huge on it because it's not going to retail it and being sold. It's very important. I encourage most people to, whatever the ideas and product they have, is to start with e-com. Most of the sales are done with this thing right here. So if I'm starting a clothing line today, you would tell me, start with e-com. Absolutely, I would. Don't worry about retail. Don't, don't worry about it. Really? Absolutely. No. I would, I, would, I would personally make any retail my second and third account. My number one account is my e-com site. For sure. Is it primarily for the profits? 
or is it because you get to, and I'm asking you this, because you mentioned you get to tell your story your way. Right. But people can't touch, they can't feel your product. Right. Or is the but, but, consumer but now conditioned They condition, to absolutely, conditioned that way. We, you know, it was, we was in the car and it was talking about 55%, 52% of people at lunchtime are online, right? Shopping online or something like that um, at their desk. They're conditioned to it. So instead of wasting money buying a bunch of inventory and worrying about stores and how you're going to look in stores and fixtures and salespeople and dealing with the markdown that they're going to hit you with, because if it doesn't sell, you build your own site. Build a small site, put up two or three T-shirts or whatever the product is you're doing and see how it goes. Why do so goes. many upstart lines fail, in your opinion? Um, I, th I think they set out to do one thing and realize it's not um, set out to do one thing, but they realize that they can't live in that space or either they haven't done the research the proper way. So they don't have a plan B. They don't have a plan B. Really? Oh, their plan A wasn't good. <laughs> and that's usually the case. Your plan A wasn't good. So if I'm starting a line, mm -hmm. for anybody who's watching and mm -hmm. wants your recommendation, what would be your recommendation? Listen, Ralph Lauren started with a, a tie. I don't know if anyone knows. He started with a wide tie. Mm -hmm. From the wide tie came a dress shirt. From the dress shirt came the polo shirt. So Ralph Lauren built his business on a tie. Sean John built, we built our business on a baseball hat. FUBU built their business on a FUBU t-shirt and a FUBU hat. So you don't need these huge collections and all these styles. Start there. Champion is one sweatshirt, right? That's how they start their yeah. business. One sweatshirt, right? The Yankees is one, really one baseball hat. So why do you need 10, 10 11, 12 styles? Because it's just, you're just accumulating invoices and debt as opposed to focus on building your site. And the other thing is that, you know, someone asked me one time, well, I want to build my site, but I don't have the money to do it. I want to do this, um, but I don't have the money to do it. Surround yourself with people who do those things. If I'm starting a company from right now and I'm 22 years old, fresh out of college, I want to start something. I would find somebody who is a tech guy who understands how to build sites. I would find somebody who, may, who might be a financial, have a, a CPA future or financial background, and I would say, hey guys, I'm gonna start this company. I'm gonna give you 10%, I'm gonna give you 15% or whatever it is to do your job, right? So say you, now you own 60% of your company. You gave them 20, you gave them 20. I'd rather own 60% of my company that's doing something as 100% of a company that's doing nothing. But you surround yourself with people who have interest in building. And, you, and there's people that do websites, there's people that are financially savvy, that you can align yourself with. I think a lot of times people align themselves with the product they want to make, they align themselves with somebody like that that's making that product as opposed to building your team. Because it's all about the team, though, how you build it. You've had incredible success in the fashion industry and in life. Mm -hmm. um, made a ton of money. You also, for anybody who's looking to get in the, into the fashion industry, mm -hmm. You know, you've done the fashion weeks, mm -hmm. you've won awards. Mm -hmm. What's next for Jeff Tweedy? I don't know. I just, I just enjoy what I do, to be honest. I just enjoy what I do. I just love what I do. Spending time with my sons. I just enjoy what I do. I, I, don't, I don't look that far ahead because I, you know, I, um, people always say, what's the future? How do you feel about life? For me, when I got out of that two bedroom apartment with nine people and you hit the light switch and roaches are everywhere. <laughs> that was it for me. That was, uh, I'm good, right? So you gotta manage, you gotta manage what's important in your life and that, that was important in my life to get there. Um, so I don't, I don't really look at what's next for me. I just continue to, I try to be a nice person, respectful person, I try to um, to continue to teach my team and embrace my team and, and let them make the right decisions. Um, and I continue to want to grow as a person and, and as a company. But I can't say what's next for me. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. That's a few fair. more questions. Right. What's the best advice you ever received? Ooh. It was probably from my mom. Um, and she said, if you're passionate about what you do, the money will come. Probably that. 
What's the worst advice you ever received? Um, why do you want to go in the fashion industry? Don't go in the fashion industry. And that was from a, 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 a professor at FIT. Really? Absolutely. And that just was like, okay, so why am I here at FIT? What am I doing? Yeah, that's the whole purpose of going to Hello. FIT. Hello. Yeah. You don't want to do this. Is there any point in your career you said to yourself where you just sat, you look around the room on a winter, mm -hmm. all of these high-end designers mm -hmm. and people who you looked up to, is there any point that you said, I made it? No. I'm here. No. You never say you made it. No. You appreciate what you have and what you've accomplished, but you don't ever say you made it. I would never say that. Never. One last question for mm -hmm. you. <clears throat> and then I got a request for everybody in the room. What advice would you give to your 21-year-old self? Wow. That's a tough one. That's, that's, that question is almost tougher than a 12-year-old kid when I was speaking one time asked me if I was saved. <laughs> I ain't know where to go with that one. I was like, I was speaking to this young uh, uh, group of teenagers from D.C. church ministry. It was like 30 of them. And he raised his hand and said, Mr. Tweedy, are you saved? I was like, <laughs> <laughs> right. That was a tough one. Um, the advice I would give my young, if I was young, 21, is probably um, appreciate the moment that I'm in. Live in the moment, appreciate the moment. I don't think I've done enough of that. I know I haven't. When we were building Sean John, it was so much. Even now, the, the accolades that we have, I don't, I don't take the time to say, that was nice. That was really good. How did you do that? Um, we just keep going. We did it in, I mean, you know. We did one fashion show at a million dollars. That was great. One to see if we did, well, okay, what's next? How do we get the next one? We don't live in that moment. I think that we, you know, you gotta celebrate your small accolades, your small success. Because that's the thing that's going to keep you, that's going to continue to drive you, no matter what it is. If you're starting a small business and there's 10 people that say, I like what you do, live in that moment, appreciate that, and, and, and feel good about that. I don't think I've done enough. I know I've done none of that. I've just kept. Since you haven't celebrated the moment, I have a request for everybody in the room. Can you stand and give it up for this week's Power Move Maker by helping me sing Happy Birthday <laughs> to you. Happy Birthday oh to my you. God. Happy Thank you. Birthday, dear Jeff. Thank you, sir. Happy birthday to you. Thank 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 you. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.